morning, everyone, and welcome to a very special Vote Vets Live on the nomination of Judge Amy Coney Barrett to serve on the United States Supreme Court. As you saw in this week's Judiciary Committee hearings, there is a lot at stake when it comes to this nomination, especially what it means for access to affordable health care in our country. We know that because President Trump uh, told us that he would only appoint judges who would throw out the ACA if confirmed. Here to talk about what the Supreme Court nomination means for veterans and military families across the United States, I'm honored to welcome Senator Tom Carper of Delaware and General Frank Vavala. Born in West Virginia and raised in Virginia, Senator Tom Carper attended The Ohio State University on a Navy ROTC scholarship. He went on to complete five years of service as a Naval Flight Officer, served three tours of duty in Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War, and continue to serve the Naval Reserve as a P-3 aircraft mission commander until retiring with the rank of captain in 1991 after 23 years of military service. He has served the people of Delaware for nearly 45 years as state treasurer, congressman, governor, and now as the senior senator from the first state. He is currently the only Vietnam veteran serving in the United States Senate. And General Frank Babla is a retired Army National Guard officer who was nominated by then Delaware Governor Tom Carper in 1999 to serve as the Adjutant General of the State of Delaware. He served in this role until 2017 and was responsible for the mission readiness of all Delaware Army National Guard units to support federal and state missions. General Babla held prominent national positions as the President of the Adjutant's General Association of the United States and Chairman of the Board of the National Guard Association of the United States, where he worked to pass one of the most significant pieces of military legislation in a generation, the National Guard Empowerment Act. He's one of the very few American service members to have risen from par, uh, private to four-star general, and today he continues his service to the country as a veterans advocacy specialist at Delaware Technical Community College. Senator Carper, General Vavala, good morning, uh, gentlemen. Thank you both for joining us today. Good morning. Thank you, Will. It's great to be with you and, uh, and all of our veterans across the country. It's great to be with General Vavala. Of all the cabinet appointments I made as governor of Delaware, the most popular even today was nominating <laughs> Frank Vavala to be our adjutant general. Yeah, we were we were talking uh, just a couple minutes ago, sir, about how uh, how lucky you were to have the general stick on for such a distinguished tenure there in a in a very tough job. So now, governors come and go. Frank Vavala stayed. <laughs> <laughs> I was truly blessed. I was ever grateful to you, Senator Crawford. Uh, I'm the lucky one. Well, Joe, I want to start uh, with some questions, uh, focusing first on health care. Uh, the Affordable Care Act was a landmark achievement for both improving health care access and making it affordable uh, in this country. And the number of uninsured veterans has dropped by nearly 40 percent since its passage. Uh, and I think it's always important to remind people that there are more than 13 million veterans who receive some form of health care coverage outside of the VA. So, Senator, just to start, what's your take on uh, the stakes for veterans across the country when it comes to the prospect of the Supreme Court overturning the Affordable Care Act? Um, the election is November 3rd. Seven days later, one week uh, later, Supreme Court uh, will meet to begin deliberations on a lawsuit uh, launched by President Trump. And I think 18 or 19 uh, Republican attorneys general across the country to not just uh, to nip, uh, you know, chip away, at the Affordable Care Act, but to repeal it it's in its entirety. There's a, a fellow named uh, Tom Friedman who writes, he's an author, speaker, uh, writes columns for the New York Times. He has something he calls the Trump Doctrine. And the Trump Doctrine, uh, according to Tom Friedman, is um, uh, Barack built it, I, I being Trump, broke it, you fix it. And uh, what if you look at, across the last uh, three and a half years, whether it's the Paris Peace Accords, you run, you run a nuclear deal agreement, uh, you name it, the, uh, including the Affordable Care Act, uh, this president has done his best to to try to uh, lift himself up by uh, getting rid of the part of the legacy of his predecessor, Barack Obama. Unfortunately, veterans are having to pay the uh, the, the price. And as it turned out, uh, since the Affordable Care Act was passed in 2010, the number of uninsured uh, veterans dropped by 40%, 40%. And uh, uh, expanded access to Medicaid, there's about 2 million veterans on, on Medicaid. We expanded Medicaid, it's now in 39 states in expanded form. The ACA, uh, again, uh, provides uh, health care access to uh, veterans in rural communities. We got a lot of rural hospitals that are open today. A lot of veterans are using those hospitals because of the ACA. Uh, the uh, the ACA has required that insurance pl uh, plans cover 
uh, mental health and substance abuse services. The ACA has taken some of the burden off of uh, uh, VA uh, health care providers and enable them to provide better health care for the veterans that are coming to their house, our hospitals, our medical centers, and uh, our community-based uh, patient clients. And finally, the ACA has helped to lower uh, prescription drug costs for nearly 11 million veterans. And finally, uh, with respect to uh, pre pre-existing conditions, uh, the, 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 the ACA says basically uh, in, people cannot be denied insurance coverage if they have a pre-existing condition. There were millions, tens of millions, probably 130 million people across the country that have pre-existing conditions. A lot of them are veterans. And the idea that the, the, those veterans and frankly the other uh, millions of people who have a pre-existing condition, that somehow they are, are going to not be able to get coverage or have to pay a lot more for that coverage, that's just wrong. So those are some of the things that, uh, that are at stake here with this nomination. Absolutely, sir. And General, I want to focus in on a part of that. Uh, you know, in, in recent years, and a lot of it's been messed up by the pandemic, but we've seen rightful focus on the transition from military service to civilian life, um, setting up service members and their families to be successful. Part of that is financial stability, uh, access to a good paying job, and health care. Um, how important is access to stable, affordable health care to make sure that service members are successful when they transition out of the military and into civilian life? Well, I feel it's vital. You know, although most veterans are eligible for health care through the VA, only about half are enrolled in VA care. Some chose not to enroll while others may live too far away from a facility to access services. In fact, almost two thirds of veterans are insured through private insurance and receive their health care, uh, one in 10 through Medicaid. The Affordable Care Act was key to expanding access to private insurance and to Medicaid. And in just the first two years of the ACA's implementation, we saw the uninsured rate for non-elderly veterans decline by nearly 40%. When an American makes the decision to serve this country, they risk their lives and risk facing severe health conditions as a result of that service. We owe it to our veterans to give them the very best access to quality care. Many, many veterans, especially those on Medicaid, have complex health needs. Many have a disability, a severe mental illness, or suffer from substance use disorder. Repealing the ACA would put millions of Americans behind, but veterans especially. By taking away protection for people with pre-existing conditions, undoing Medicaid expansion, and reducing coverage by providers for life-saving services like treatment for opioid misuse or mental illness. I believe lives are on the line with the Supreme Court decision, and it would be a disgrace for the highest court of the land to turn their backs on the millions of Americans who have lived better lives as a result of this health care law, especially for our veterans who have already sacrificed so much for our country. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Uh, Senator, I want to talk a little bit more about pre-existing conditions, which you mentioned. Veterans certainly have a lot when it comes to uh, that issue and what's at stake. A lot of post 9-11 veterans, as we now know, are facing health consequences that are tied uh, to their exposure to open air burn pits in Iraq and Afghanistan. And it's an issue that the military and the VA are still uh, really struggling to figure out how to address in its scope. For veterans who have a condition like that, uh, but aren't enrolled, or maybe they're not eligible for the full scope of care at the VA, how harmful would it be uh, to lose the ACA's provisions surrounding protections for people with pre-existing conditions? The, uh, most of us have heard of uh, the golden rule, and most of us try to live our lives by the golden rule. And the golden rule simply says you treat other people the way you'd want to be treated. When you have something like one in three non-elderly veterans with a pre-existing condition, and you face the prospect of the Supreme Court taking up uh, a hearing uh, on November 10th to get rid of uh, protection against pre-existing conditions and the assurance that people can get coverage and get the care they need. That's not the way I would want to treat anybody, much less to, to treat uh, a veteran. As General Babala has said, we, we uh, as a veteran myself, 
certainly is, is Frank Tapple is a is a, a real hero uh, in, uh, in 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 our state. Uh, we uh, we especially want to make sure that we're looking out for for uh, for, for veterans. There's uh, I'm told um, during the, this pandemic we're about what is it, about six seven months into it, and uh, hopefully by uh, by the, big, the end of the year, beginning of the new year, we'll have a virus uh, in order to, uh, not a virus but a, a vaccine. To enable us to uh, to basically take that virus on head head first and and beat it, uh, but uh, but for right now uh, that's not the case. We have to do a lot of smart things, you know, in, in terms of uh, wearing masks and you know hand sanitizers, you know, social distancing and so forth. But right now, there's over seven million Americans who have contracted the coronavirus, and a number of them have uh, pre have walking away from that with a pre existing condition. Seven million of them, veterans, Amer Americans rather, and a bunch of them are veterans. And uh, uh, I, everybody on this call knows somebody who's, who's contracted the virus. Uh, and I do too. And sometimes they get better and they stay better. Sometimes they have uh, uh, so conditions that continue for days, weeks, months, years. And we want to make sure that if that's the case, those folks have access to good care and don't lose it. Absolutely. Uh, in general, I want to talk, we've talked a lot about veterans, but we can't separate healthcare from uh, our military's readiness uh, because that readiness in part depends on the ability of men and women in uniform to focus on the mission at hand and doing their jobs. Um, something that can obviously detract from that, something that I know a lot of us who serve in uniform have seen um, is the toll of a service member worrying about a sick loved one, whether that's you know mother or father battling cancer or a sibling injured in a car accident. In that context, do you think that access to affordable health care for all Americans is somewhat um, inseparable from our ability to make sure that service members can do their jobs while trusting that loved ones are going to be taken care of if they have a health need arise? Absolutely, Will. You know, our service members are caretakers by nature. They risk their own lives to protect their fellow soldiers and Americans that they'll never meet. So, of course, it's not surprising that when many of our men and women in uniform come home, they continue to care for and serve those friends, family members, and neighbors who might need help. That's stressful enough. We don't need our service members having to worry about whether or not the care of a loved one needs to be covered by their insurance. And let's not forget, as Senator Carper pointed out, that we're in the middle of a pandemic. This devastating virus has infected over 7 million people across the country, and we know the virus can have lasting consequences. Those who've been infected may be added to the list of folks that our service members are caring for, and their ailments will be pre-existing conditions. Without the Affordable Care Act, we could go back to a time when insurance companies could charge you more just because you have a pre-existing condition. Those bills add up and place huge strain on families, especially when you're demanding high pressure jobs, when you have that demanding and high pressure job in the military. The Affordable Care Act took a huge weight off the shoulders of so many Americans, including our veterans. It'd be wrong to place the burden back on them by invalidating the health care law. Absolutely. And gentlemen, I, you know, we've talked about the policy. Um, to close out, I'd like to ask you both a little bit of a broader question. We've heard from veterans over the last four years, really, with President Trump, um, but around this issue in specific, that beyond the issues and the cases at play, they feel like the way that Senator McConnell has gone about this whole confirmation process and looking back at his refusal to seat um, Judge Garland when President Obama was in office that the majority leader's approach is really an affront to the values of um, fairness and decency that so many people have served to uphold in uniform. As veterans, what do you think the process says about um, the state of our country and the health of our political system as a whole? Senator, uh, starting with you. We are uh, gonna be, uh, we'll use backups, less than a month before an election less than a month before the election, where the incumbent president is trailing badly across the country against former Vice President Biden. 
uh, that president, sitting president, is trying to do what no president's ever done, push through a nomination of the Supreme Court, uh, bear, not even a month before, uh, before that election. Uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, was once in, in a situation when, when he was president, he had the opportunity, there was a vacancy in the Supreme Court, he had the opportunity to fill that vacancy, it was roughly a month before uh, the election. And he said it would be wrong for me to nominate uh, someone to fill that vacancy. We should have an election, whoever was elected uh, as president in that election, I guess this was in 1864, should have the right to, to, make, that, to, to make that choice. Uh, it was right for the right thing for Lincoln to do. Uh, about, uh, if you go back uh, to, I think, roughly 1910, uh, Barack Obama, Ju Justice Scalia, uh, passed away. There was a vacancy on, on the, uh, the Supreme Court. I forget the, the exact year. But uh, it occurred roughly seven, seven or eight months before an election. And uh, Barack Obama nominated a uh, federal judge, uh, Merrick Garland, who was the chief judge of the top appellate court, top appeals court in the country. He had already been confirmed to, to that position overwhelmingly, I think by like 80 or 90 uh, votes uh, for being confirmed for that senior judicial uh, position. And Barack Obama nominated him to fill the vacancy left by the, the, uh, the death of uh, Justice uh, Scalia. Um, the Republicans uh, not only uh, refused to have a hearing uh, for that uh, nomination, seven months before an election, uh, they uh, refused to meet with him, to talk to him on the phone. And uh, basically he said, no, uh, we're going to wait. The, the right thing to do is to have an election. Whoever wins the election gets to nominate the, to fill the school year vacancy. That uh, was just flat out wrong. Flat out wrong thing to do. One of the hallmarks of leaders is that they figure out what the right thing to do is and do it. They treat other people the way that they want to be treated. And in this case, this uh, president and uh, my colleagues uh, on the other side, that are, a, a number of whom are my friends, have, uh, I think, done the wrong thing, I think, for our country. And I think certainly for, uh, for uh, uh, their, their party. Yeah, the last thing I would, uh, would, would, would say, there is uh, a lot more on the line here uh, than, you know, whether somebody's going to get his way, be able to bully and push, push his way through. The, 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 the prospective loss of protections, the Affordable Care Act, including uh, protections against the loss of uh, coverage. The, uh, the kind of environmental st uh, standards we have uh, in, uh, at, at risk. We have a nominee here who doesn't believe that climate change is caused by us as, as humans and our emissions that we can control, doesn't believe it. Uh, and with that being the, the greatest threat we face as a planet, uh, this, is, this is not something that should be, should be rushed through. So that's that's uh, how I respond to that. Well, thank you. Absolutely, sir. Uh, General, your thoughts on on overall what this uh, approach towards the judiciary is doing to our country? Well, Will, as a as a member of the military, I tried to be objective throughout my career and be a political and looking at this thing. But you know, in in this particular case, when I when I look at it, and I agree with what Senator Carper said, I'm a bore. I'm, I'm abhorred by the process. Uh, you know, we have essentially politicized what we're doing. And again, to emphasize what he said, I believe it's inherently wrong. Well, gentlemen, we're short on time. And Senator, I want to ask you, you know, one final question. People, um, I think, have been also somewhat discouraged. Some of our supporters have heard it, you know, and just the, the way that this has shook out, seeing um, Justice Barrett headed, Judge Barrett headed for, um, confirmation. Why is it important that people um, keep the faith, stay involved, and continue to make their voices heard uh, when it comes to issues like this nomination and others that we're going to see play out over the next few months? At the end of the day, we get to vote. At the end of the day, we get to vote. When I was uh, in Southeast Asia in 1970, 1972, I was a voting officer for my squadron. We had 300 men in my squadron. We had 300 men registered to vote, ready to vote in their uh, primaries ready to vote in the general uh, election. And they almost all did that. They have a right to vote and we wanna make sure they have a right to, we wanna make sure that people in this country not just vote, but they uh, they speak and reach out to their elected officials. There are 100 senators, I'm one of them, privileged to be one of them. And every day, uh, I have, uh, we have about a million people in Delaware, we have three counties, and uh, we have offices in all three counties, county seats of each one. And every day, the phones are, are, are 
you know, people are calling uh, my offices and we have live persons even at night to, to respond to, to those, to those calls. Uh, and, uh, at the end of a, of a day, I get a, uh, a message from my staff, how many calls we get, what do they call about? And, uh, if, uh, if I get a lot of calls that say, uh, don't vote to confirm uh, this particular nominee because the concerns of losing the Affordable Care Act or frankly a disregard for climate change. I, I listen to that and other senators do as well. The, uh, I used to be the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee. I used to be on the Amtrak Board of Directors. Both of them have the motto of when you see something, say something. When you see something, say something. And they, uh, we, need to, we need to speak up and veterans especially have, have a big uh, stake here. And I would just say call the, the Capitol switchboard. Veterans across the country, if you call this number, 202-224-3121, that's 202-224-3121, and ask to be connected to your senators, one of your senators, one or both of your senators, especially the Republican senator. And uh, I would urge you to do that. Uh, your voice matters, your vote matters. Uh, please make sure that your voice is heard and your vote is counted. Thank you and God bless you. Well said. Thank you, sir. Senator Carper, General Babala, thank you both uh, for taking the time this morning will, will. for the discussion. Sir, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> My USS Delaware hat. The uh, <laughs> first state to ratify the Constitution just has, has the newest uh, nuclear submarine in the Navy. Fast attack nuclear submarine uh, commissioned on April 4th at sea, under the sea. And we'll be having we'll have, have a big celebration in Delaware next uh, next year. The uh, the, the person who's going to break the, the champagne bottle on the submarine, God willing, will be the first lady of the United States. That would be Jill Biden. That would be incredible to watch. I salute you all. That's, God a, bless you. that's a great that is a great positive note to end it on. Um, we'll look forward to to watching that one. And thank you so much, sir, for um, your support of us at Fofets, General Bavala. Thank you for your time. Uh, and everything you do. We really appreciate it. We'll see you soon, gentlemen. All right. Bravo, Zulu. God bless. Thank you. Bravo, Zulu. Thanks so much. <laughs> and thanks, everyone, for watching uh, and making your voices heard on this issue. I promise us at Vote Vets will continue to work with you uh, to resist this nomination to the Supreme Court and also advocate for veterans and military families across the board. Please, as the center said, keep calling Congress uh, and demanding that they listen to the voices of veterans and military families across the country. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.